and with the permission of the chair, the first keynote address is on echocardiographic evaluation pre-TAVI. Dr. S.C. Govind, senior consultant and non-invasive cardiology and head of Ecolab at Narayan Hrudayalaya would be delivering the lecture. Good morning to all of you. Uh, the transcatheter procedures are increasing in number and uh, we, after somewhere around 2002, we have the transcatheter aortic valve replacement, also called as the TAVI, the implant. Uh, over a period of uh, a decade or more, it has progressed uh, rapidly and it has established uh, now as a successful uh, technique and it's got very good outcomes. So I'll be looking at how we uh, can assess these patients uh, echocardiographically. Uh, the TAVI team uh, basically consists of both the cardiology and the cardiothoracic uh, surgery uh, departments. The, it is headed uh, primarily by the interventional uh, cardiologist and it is supported by the imaging specialist and also by the anesthesiologist and the other parts of members of the support team. The imaging in TAVI mainly is confined uh, to the echo and uh, the next is CT and then to some extent MRI and uh, angiogram. ECHO is the primary uh, modality which uh, uh, is used uh, in initial uh, stages. It is basically to look at TAVI eligibility and also to look at whether once the patient is eligible, will there be a successful outcome. The role of ECHO will uh, be primarily looking at uh, transthoracic ECHO and also to transesophageal ECHO, which combines both 2D as well as 3D. And this can uh, be used in pre-procedure, procedure as well as post procedure. So let's look at how echo can be used in uh, these patients who are likely to undergo uh, the TAVI. So one is we need to establish that there is severe aortic stenosis. There are standard uh, parameters, guidelines and uh, the main parameters here are the velocity has to be more than four meters across the uh, stenotic aortic valve. We need to have a mean gradient of more than 40 millimeters of mercury and an aortic valve area of less than one centimeter square. But many a times, these patients can come in uh, different uh, uh, scenarios. Uh, here we have one type of patient. This is the normal flow high gradient aortic stenosis with preserved LV ejection fraction. And you can also have patients with low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis with preserved LV ejection fraction where the stroke volume is low. And here you have the low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis and reduced LV ejection fraction. Any of these patients, if they are established as severe aortic stenosis and uh, they are considered uh, in the next stage to look for TAVI. Now, these gradients are not very reliable, uh, as you can see in the lower uh, two categories of patients. So, we need to look at the continuity equation and also the planimetry. As far as the uh, continuity equation is concerned, again, there are some limitations. There can be some problems because when we take the uh, left ventricular outflow track, we assume it to be circular, but it is most often oval. So again, the calculations can go normal and the aortic stenotic area can be uh, a little miscalculated. So here, usually the sagittal diameter is less and the coronal diameter is more. And uh, uh, if it is oval like this, it's a problem as to if one goes by one single uh, linear measurement. So we need to look at an alternative to this. So uh, can it be done by planimetry? Now with the advent of the newer machines, we have biplane imaging. And this can be used both in transthoracic echo as well as transesophageal echo, where we can do the cut very uh, in, a, in an exact plane so that uh, we don't have any obliquity or any errors in uh, uh, the plane itself. So this can be used to get a good planimetered area across the uh, aortic valve, both in transthoracic as well as transesophageal echo. And of course, one can acquire a full data set. It's uh, a little more uh, time consuming, but uh, one, after acquiring the 3D data set, uh, one needs to go through the various alignments and then the precision so that we need to get the stenotic uh, orifice right at the center and then the uh, uh, area can be planimeter. So this is the other option that can be uh, used in, uh, uh, in transesophageal echo 3D uh, uh, application. And we need to rule out any significant uh, aortic uh, regurgitation also, apart from uh, looking at the uh, stenotic area. Now, the most important uh, part of uh, the measurement uh, when it comes to a patient being selected for TAVI is the aortic analysizing. It's a powerful predictor of the outcomes. So the aortic analysis 
as you can see, this is a normal patient as to how the uh, shape of the annulus dynamically changes. So if one takes a linear measurement, a, a, measurement, a single measurement, uh, one can get into problems and uh, the calculations of the aortic value area can be uh, problematic and also the annulus also, uh, if you take one measurement, uh, it is not very, it is not reflective of the actual annulus uh, shape. The annulus can be of different uh, uh, shapes, you know, it can be something like a circular shape, it can be oval or it, it is not truly uh, 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 no, a shape like this but it is uh, sort of a representative where it can be of an odd uh, unequal uh, shape also. One has to keep in mind that the annulus has to be, if it is going to be sized, we need to have uh, a good parasol long axis. This is in the parasol uh, long axis area. The, uh, the LV is at uh, this point and then you need to have the LV, RV and the left HM and the iota uh, properly uh, sort of symmetrically uh, visualized. And then the alignment has to be good and uh, made sure that uh, the exact point where it is going to be measured is located and then the measurement is made. Now, the uh, things can go wrong here. Uh, with the help of biplane imaging, one can make out if one is too much to the sides laterally, then one can get a small uh, uh, aortic annulus here. So if there is a biplane imaging, one can get a uh, good measurement, uh, an exact uh, a precise area where the drop is going to be made. And uh, ideally, it should be both the uh, sagittal as well as the coronal and then you get both the minimal and the maximal diameter and then one can also take the mean diameter and then also the circumferential uh, area also can be uh, used. The problem with the aortic uh, annulus if it is not sized properly is that undersizing can lead to paravalvular leak or it can lead to device migration. Oversizing can lead to aortic root hematoma or a rupture or it can also cause coronary uh, osteal obstruction uh, in certain types of uh, processes. After the annulus is sized, then the uh, iota has to be uh, assessed. This is in the supraiotic area. So this is the usual uh, areas where it is marked. Uh, this is the sinus and then the sinotubular ridge. Both transthoracic and as uh, well as the transesophageal echo can be used. Next would be looking at the aortic, uh, the ascending aorta diameter and this is uh, roughly somewhere around uh, 4 centimeters from the annulus or the maximal diameter is measured. The sizing is important because uh, there are uh, different types of processes and some of them require these sizes to select this perfect uh, processes size. The types of implant, uh, these are the ones which ha have a lot of literature, there are a lot of newer implants which have come and uh, this is uh, one type, this is the Edward Sapiens and then this is the core, uh, metronic core valve. So this is, as you can see the analyst is uh, going to hold it very tightly and uh, this is the point where the problem can occur if it is not positioned properly. If it goes too high and if it goes too below there are problems both uh, uh, supraiotic as well as subiotic. Now subiotic also can be an issue. You can have a small LVOT and if the device is positioned a little lower, it can cause obstruction in the left ventricular outflow tract and it can also cause uh, some amount of uh, uh, leak or the, uh, the, the device itself can be positioned uh, in a wrong manner. So the sizing of the LVOT also is equally important. There are certain uh, abnormalities like uh, the uh, septal bulge wherein you can have the basal segment of the, uh, 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 the, the, the anterior septum which can be thickened and this can project uh, and project into the LVOT and this can cause a problem if the device is uh, positioned a little lower and can again cause obstruction. So these are uh, some variations one has to keep in mind and also the oval LVOT can also be a problem uh, with uh, the uh, device's uh, design. And of course, this is the, uh, the rare occasions when one can have a subbiotic membrane which is more of a surgical issue. So uh, one uh, has to be careful. Uh, this is more of an exception rather than a rule. But one needs to keep in mind that there can be abnormalities also uh, uh, presenting at the same time. And also one needs to look at the valve morphology. The ideal valve would be a tri-leaflet, tricuspid aortic valve and uh, this is where there is a lot of data uh, and that is because as you can see here the analyst is more likely to be uh, 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 circular in uh, the uh, patient who has tricuspid, tri-leaflet aortic valve. Now what about bicuspid aortic valve? It can be done but it's not ideal. As you can see here that the analyst is more oval in shape and uh, this can cause problems if the device is not uh, uh, positioned uh, uh, 
properly and you can have paraviral leak which can uh, lead to issues. So the bicuspid valve is not ideal but uh, it has been shown that it can be done in such scenarios but there is always a problem that paraviral leaks can occur. Calcification is another issue one uh, needs, to, uh, needs to look into. So calcification of the margins of the cusps and also calcification which can occur below and above the valve also. You can see the calcification at the uh, aortic sinus here and calcification extending down into the LVO. So these are also issues uh, which can lead to ruptures or uh, again paravalvular leak uh, can be a problem. Coronary osteo also can be uh, measured to some extent. Uh, especially with uh, the 3D where you can have the measurement right from the point where the analysis is and you can look at the length of the cusp and then to point at where it meets. So the length, uh, the height of the, uh, uh, the, the, the cusp and the point where the uh, osteo uh, is uh, anatomically seen and measured can be made out especially with the 3D data set of the transesophageal echo. Other valvular abnormalities one has to keep in mind is mitral regurgitation. Usually there is always going to be some amount of mitral regurgitation because of the increased uh, afterload, the pressure, and once the TAVI is in, uh, the device is in place, this uh, mitral regurgitation comes down. But if there is significant MR, this can uh, alter the outcome. So this also needs to be looked into and also the severity of mitral regurgitation needs to be kept in mind. If there is an increase in uh, MR later on, then it might be due to the device itself. And uh, also, in these patients who have a lot of calcification, they can have calcific uh, mitral valve also. So, and this can cause a mitral stenosis. And if the device is a little uh, lower down again, this can restrict the movement of the uh, anti-mitral leaflet and this can worsen the scenario. So, the uh, mitral valve orifice also needs to be looked into. Then, to sort of complete the uh, uh, evaluation one has to look at the left ventricle in terms of its size and then in terms of its function and then also in terms of its uh, uh, thickening whether the LVH how much is it there and then uh, we need to monitor the LVH later on after the device is put in place. The right ventricle also needs to be assessed in terms of its size function and then also to look at the severity of tricuspid regurgitation and also the PA pressure. The, uh, the role of echo primarily is to look at the landing zone uh, of the processes and uh, this is primarily when you look at the supra valve to make sure that the aortic root calcium does not affect and then the aortic cusp height and the distance to LMCA does not cause any obstruction and again wall motion abnormalities and infra valve uh, there is no septal uh, hypertrophy, the septal bulge into the LVOT and also to look at mitral valve disease. The imaging methods that are available uh, apart from echo you have CT and CA, uh, the um, uh, CMR and uh, this is a comparison and you can see that uh, the aortic stenosis uh, uh, severity where the transthoracic uh, really scores and then looking at the LV function, the septal thickness and again looking at associated uh, uh, valvular disease. The CT provides better picture as far as the analysis is concerned and then again looking at the anatomy, looking at the calcification and also to look at the aortic root measurements and uh, this is where the precision of the CT is uh, much more superior. So during the procedure just a few slides. Uh, one uh, needs uh, uh, the echo to sort of guide the interventionist, to guide the deployment and to look at where the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the process is positioned and also look, to look at stability and one can use these uh, various views, the long axis, the short axis and the epical phi chamber and uh, you can look at uh, the two different types of uh, processes which is seen here. And uh, both TTE and TE can be used but preferably TTE is the uh, more practical one. And uh, at the time of procedure, one needs to look at the aortic valve uh, leaks and also to look at the gradients if it is uh, acceptable or not. And also once in a while, uh, uh, it can be a problem in terms of aortic parallel leak uh, and uh, this also uh, needs to be assessed and then uh, uh, needs to be quantified as far as possible and especially in such situations, T can be used uh, which is much more informative. So, uh, primarily, it is basically to look at coronary artery obstruction, to look at tamponade, to look at dissection and any annulus injury, the mitral valve injury. This is during uh, peri-procedural uh, uh, scenarios. Post-procedure, it's just like a typical uh, uh, aortic valve. 
uh, need to look at the gradients, the valve area, the Doppler velocity index, and then uh, the parallel leaks, which uh, is a big problem, and uh, this needs to be focused upon and uh, given a lot of importance. And of course, looking at the mitral valve, whether there is any worsening of MR, whether there is any worsening of the stenotic area, and how is the LV function uh, improving, the LV mass, LVH, is, is it improving, PA pressure coming down, and also possibility of device migration yeah. also needs to be looked into over a period of time. If it is a little undersized, it can migrate, so we need to make sure that it is in the right position. And uh, also to look at whether it is undersized also in terms of uh, uh, processes uh, mismatch. So to conclude, uh, uh, TAVI or TAVA pre-assessment, one is to establish aortic valve disease, and uh, once the patient is selected for TAVI, analyst sizing is very important, and then looking at the aortic root, ascending aorta, coronary ostia, the anatomy, the measurements is important, and looking at the LVOT in terms of any uh, issues below the valve is important, and looking at the morphology of the valve, whether it is tri-leaflet or bi-leaflet, and looking at the calcification, and also looking at associated disease uh, of mitral valve, MS, MR, and also ARTR, and looking at the LV and RV uh, uh, chambers. And uh, intra and post, it is useful to guide deployment of the valve, and also to look at the landing zone, and then to look at the position and stability of the valve, and to look at any AR, whether it is uh, perivalvular or uh, 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 transvalvular, and to look at gradients, and also to look at any uh, adjacent structures which have been affected. And also to follow up for uh, the outcome and the complications uh, in terms of long-term uh, uh, monitoring. So this, in essence, is uh, the role of ECHO as far as uh, uh, identifying a patient for TAVI, and then again, uh, pre-assessment uh, for TAVI, and also for post-assessment. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Govind. Please have your seat with the chair. We'll come back to the discussion at the end of the next keynote address together.